Okay. Um, welcome to this evening's class. My name is Storm Kennedy Palmer. I've been one of the module lecturers for eight years on this module. Um, and I think if you can hold any questions until the end of the presentation, we're going to be covering Learning Unit 3 today, which is the financial market model. And fortunately, you'll see this is a very simple version of the model that we use in this module. I'm skipping ahead here to show you the functioning of monetary policy. This is the financial market model based on the idea that the amount of money is determined from within the model itself, mainly by how much people want to hold onto money. This is known as demand determined or exogenously determined money, endogenously determined money. So the more people want to hold money, the more money there will be. This means there's no separate curve for the money supply because it's all tied up to how much people want to hold. In other words, no independent money supply curve since the quantity of money depends on the money demand and the interest rate. The central bank can't directly control how much money there is because it's determined by how much people want to hold. However, the central bank can indirectly affect the amount of money by changing the interest rate. If the interest rate is lower, borrowing money becomes cheaper. This then encourages people and businesses to borrow more, which leads to an increase in the amount of money in circulation. Think of this in terms of our own South African Reserve Bank, who sets the repo rate in order to impact borrowing, which has an effect on the level of output and income. In the financial market, we only look at the impact of a change in interest rates on the amount of money in circulation. In later learning units, another model will capture the effects of monetary policy on the level of output and income. Look at this graph on the left-hand side. It shows an expansionary monetary policy. The interest rate is measured on the y-axis, and the quantity of money, M, is measured on the x-axis. When the central bank lowers the interest rate, in this case from I1 to I2, we see that it's represented by movement along the money demand curve, which increases the quantity of money from M1 to M2. We can represent this movement with a chain of events as well. Here we say monetary expansion leads to a decrease in the interest rate, which leads to an increase in the demand for money, which leads to an increase in the quantity of money. We see the exact opposite for a contractionary monetary policy, where the central bank will increase the interest rate, in this case from I to I2, leading to a movement up the money demand curve, and a decrease in the quantity of money. Now that's the, the crux of this model. This is the important bit that you need to understand to see how it fits into the bigger picture of this module. But we need to go into more detail about our money demand and how it's derived. So now I'm actually gonna go backwards a bit and go to the demand for money. The money demand curve is determined by the active and passive demand for money. The demand for active balances depends on people wanting to do transactions. More transactions mean a greater demand for money. This demand for money for transactions comes from the fact that money is used as a medium of exchange. The question is, what affects the number of transactions? The number of transactions and thus the need for active balances is determined by the level of output and income in the economy. As the level of output and income increases, the income of households also increases and they will want to do more transactions. I don't know why my highlighter skips like that. Apologies for that. And they're going to do more transactions. As producers produce more output, they will need more money to finance their transactions. In addition, the higher the person's income, the stronger the precautionary motive for holding money. However, to simplify our analysis, 
we're only going to focus on the transactions motive. And so we can represent this by the chain of events. An increase in the level of output and income leads to an increase in active transactions, which leads to an increase in the demand for money. The demand for passive balances, also referred to as the speculative demand for money, is, rela is related to the need by financial market participants to keep wealth in the form of money. In this sense, money is viewed as a financial asset. Sometimes financial market participants wish to hold money not because they want to do active transactions, but because they have a need to keep their wealth in the most liquid asset that there is, which is money. Thus, the speculative demand for money stems from the store of value function of money. Keeping money is liquid, while bonds give a return in the form of interest, but are less liquid. So why choose bonds? The reason is the cost of not earning interest when holding money. The higher the interest rate, the higher the cost because money doesn't earn interest. Given this opportunity cost, we can expect that the cost of holding money goes up, which is the interest rate. Financial market participants will be less likely to hold money. So there's a negative relationship between the interest rate and the demand for money. In simple words, when the interest rate goes up, interest rate goes up, the demand for money goes down, and vice versa. To summarize, the demand for money is a function of the nominal level of output and income and the interest rate. The positive sign under the Y indicates a positive relationship. And the negative sign under the interest rate indicates a negative relationship. Now that we understand the determinants of the demand for money, we can represent it graphically. When representing the demand for money graphically, we indicate the interest rate on the vertical axis and the quantity of money on the horizontal axis. The demand for money curve is downward sloping to reflect the negative relationship between the interest rate and the demand for money. Looking at this first diagram, you can see that if the interest rate increases from I to I2, the quantity of money decreases from, I can't highlight this one. Okay. I can't highlight it, but from M1 to M2, which is represented by this upward movement along the money demand curve. Looking at the second diagram, we can see that if the level of output and income increases from Y1 to Y2, the demand for active balances increases. That's financial market participants wish to do more transactions. <clears throat> At each interest rate, the demand for money is higher. The quantity of money is higher as well. So we can summarize this very simply by saying that a change in the interest rate results in a movement along the money demand curve, while a change in the level of output and income results in a shift of the MD curve. That's because the interest rate is endogenous to this graph, whereas the level of output and income is exogenous, so it's going to result in a shift when it does change. The global financial crisis of 2007 to 2008 reminded us again that events in the financial market have a major impact on events in the goods market, and the determination of the level of output and income cannot be studied without taking the financial market events into account. In Learning Unit 2, we built the goods market and showed how the demand for goods determines the level of output and income in the economy. In this learning unit, we build a model of the financial market, which we're going to use later in learning unit four 
to show how the interaction between the goods market and the financial market determines the level of output and income in the ISLM model. So you can see the financial market becomes the LM curve. The central bank chooses the interest rate, which affects the cost of credit and loans, and therefore affects the demand for money and the quantity of money. Therefore, in the ISLM curve, in the ISLM model, the LM curve is represented by a horizontal line, as shown here. Okay, so it's taken me only around 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, to summarize this entire learning unit. So obviously there's a lot of detail I've not been able to cover. So you need to study the full learning unit in the study guide to prepare for the exam. But let's quickly run through the learning unit outcomes. This is something that you need to do on your own after studying each learning unit to make sure that you understand everything that's expected of you. The first outcome is to explain the difference between income, wealth, and money. I didn't touch on this at all, so I'll quickly summarize it for you now. Wealth is the total value of assets owned, representing an accumulated financial value. Income is money earned or received over a specific time period, indicating the flow of funds. And money is the medium of exchange used for transactions, facilitating economic activity. In this model, money consists of fiat currency, coins and notes issued by the central bank, and checkable deposits held at banks. The second outcome is to explain the functions of money. I explain the function of money as the medium of exchange when discussing the demand for active balances, as well as its function as, as a store of value when discussing the demand for passive balances. Money also serves as a unit of account and a standard of deferred payment. The third outcome is to explain the portfolio decisions of financial market participants. This refers to the choice by financial market participants regarding how much of various assets to hold. In our simplified financial market, there's only a choice between money and bonds. And the rest of the outcomes are covered at length in this presentation. They are distinguish between the demand for active and passive balances, describe in words and in events chain the link between output and income and the demand for active balances, describe in words and in events chain the link between the interest rates and the demand for active or passive balances, explain the demand for money, and describe with the aid of diagrams the demand for money. Okay, so that's the learning unit summarized. Now I'm going to start working through some revision questions with you. And this is where I'd really like to encourage your participation. So if you have any input, please um, raise your hand. Our first question, a true or false question one, is financial wealth can be held in different assets such as shares, bonds, houses, residential property, and foreign exchange. Do you agree with this statement? Is it true or is it false? Lavuya, I think I saw a hand from you. It might have been an accident. Yes, I think the statement is. Yes, hi. Yes, I was saying, I think the statement is correct. True. Yes, I agree with you. Um, wealth is the total value of all assets owned, and everything listed in the statement is an asset. So the statement is true. Thank you for that. Let's go on to our next question. Lavuya, did you have another question, or is that the same hand? It's the same hand, ma'am. I'm trying to lower it. Sorry. Okay, no problem. I just wanted to make sure you didn't have something else to say. Um, okay, true or false question two. Money does not form part of financial assets. Does anyone have a thought on that? Sibo Kele, I saw your hand first. Um, it's false. Yes, I agree. Money forms part of financial wealth, therefore this statement is false. True or false question three. The demand for active balances is related to people's decisions and the need to keep wealth in the form of money. Um, Kumo, 
No, that my hand was for question two. I'm sorry. I'm uh, no, it's old one. no problem. Does anybody have a thought about question three? I think the statement is uh, is false. But demand for electronic balances relating to table balances and to make transactions. Hundred percent. Hundred percent correct. Thank you. Question four. The higher the interest rate on bonds, the lower the opportunity cost of holding money. Well, I see some people are also answering the chat. Problem is I can't see um, what question you're referring to, but I think the brain can't see your first name. Sorry. Um, yeah, exactly. So yes, it's false. The higher the opportunity cost if the interest rate is higher. Question five. The level of output and income is indicated on the horizontal axis of the demand for money diagram. If you have the ability to do this in the exam, you must always just go check the diagram. So let's have a look. Is the statement true or false? False. Great. It's the quantity of money that's indicated on the horizontal axis. Question six. Demand determined money implies that an increase in the quantity of money leads to an increase in money demand. Got a true? Does anybody else um, have a suggestion? So demand determined money implies that an increase in money demand leads to an increase in the quantity of money. So if you think back to our chain of events, an increase in MD leads to an increase in M, not the other way around. This statement is saying that an increase in M leads to an increase in MD. So it's reversed the causality, meaning that the statement is false. OK, question seven. In this module, the financial market is based on the assumption that money is exogenously determined not endogenously determined. I've got the chat open, so if anyone raised a hand and I missed it, I apologize. If you're comfortable to um, answer the question verbally, then just go ahead and start speaking, because I'm just worried I'm going to miss a hand while I'm looking at the chat. That's true. OK, so this this module that we that we're in ECS 2602, used to use a um, an exogenously determined money supply years ago and with the updated textbook we changed it and it's now the endogenously determined um, money which is more consistent with what our reserve bank actually does in practice and essentially all it means is with the endogenously determined money it's determined by the model itself, and there's no independent money supply curve. If you did this model or module um, four, three or four years ago, you would have seen that in the financial market there was an independent money supply curve, which then reacted with the demand for money curve. Now we only have the money demand curve, which means that we're using demand determined money um, and that's known as the endogenously determined model. Question eight. The impact of an increase in the interest rates on the demand for money can be represented by an upward movement along the money demand curve. Let's just check the diagram. Do you agree with this statement? I'll say false. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Was that a yes? Do you agree? No, I said false. False. OK, so let's have a look here. The impact of an increase in the interest rate. So we would start then at I1. Now, if we increase it from I1. You, you can see my highlighter here. Yes. yes. OK, I'm relieved. I've been using it the whole time and I forgot to ask if you can see it. OK, so if we increase from I1 to I2. 
uh, what is our amount of money can be represented? OK, so we increase it, which means we start here at this point, and then we're going to move upwards. So it is, in fact, an upward movement along the money demand. So the statement is true. The two factors that determine the money demand are the level of output and income and the interest rate. Do you agree with the statement? True. Yes. Yes, that's true. Yeah, so when we um, discuss the demand for money as a function, it's a function only in this model, the simplified model of the nominal level of output and income and the interest rate. There's a positive relationship between the demand for money and the level of output and a negative relationship between the money demand and the interest rate. Question 10. Monetary policy can be defined as measures by monetary authorities to influence government spending and the interest rate to achieve stable prices, full employment, and economic growth. What do you think? No, I think it's it's false. Government spending, full employment, and economic growth. Yeah. So fiscal. Yes. So government spending is referring to fiscal policy, which is handled in a different model. Uh, we're only looking at monetary policy, which is the central bank. Question 11. An increase in the repo rate increases the interest rate on loans. And as the interest rate on loans increases, the demand for money decreases and the number of loans decreases. Consequently, fewer demand deposits are created and the quantity of money decreases. Do you agree? It's true. Yeah, it's true. Question 12. The aim of contractionary monetary policy is to decrease the level of economic activity. Therefore, the SOB will decrease the repo rate. Let's have a look at the diagram. It's uh, false. Yeah. Exactly, because the statement is saying that the SOB will decrease the repo rate. As we know, that a monetary contraction is actually an increase in the interest rate. And in our financial market model, that will decrease the demand for money and decrease the quantity of money. And it's only in the ISLM model that we'll see the impact of that on the level of economic activity, but for this um, for this presentation, you would have noticed already that this is wrong because it says decrease in the repo rate when it should be an increase. Question 13, the repo rate is the rate at which private banks borrow money from the central bank. True. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Thank you. Question 14. Decreasing the repo rate implies that the central bank implements an expansionary monetary policy. Check the graph again. Yes, yes, it's, it's true. Yeah, that's true. And question 15. Demand deposits constitute the main share of the quantity of money in the economy. True or false? False. It's true. Um, in our economy, demand deposits represent the majority, and then actual physical coins and cash represent by far the minority. But that's one of those little details that exists in the study guide uh, that I didn't tell you today. So. Please make sure that you go through your, your study guide properly when you're preparing for the exam so that you don't miss these, these details. Um, but thank you for all your um, guesses and the bravery to be wrong. It's fantastic because we all learn from it. Okay, so now I'm going to move to 
um, combination type questions, which this is the kind of thing you're going to see in an exam type scenario. Combination question one. To calculate an individual's financial wealth, the following different kinds of assets will form part of it. So the first option, we've got salary, bonds, interest received from bonds, and the value of his or her house. Is there anything there that does not constitute wealth? Salary. Yes. So this question is requiring you to understand the difference between income and financial wealth. And income is a flow variable, meaning that it's expressed over a period of time, which means it's including, as you rightly point out, salary. It's also including the interest received from bonds. So these are both incomes, they're not wealth, which means that, means that this is not option. And if we look at option two, it's including salary. So that automatically disqualifies it. If we look at option three, we've got the balance on the check account, cash, bonds, shares, the value of the person's house and their paintings. Is there anything in there that doesn't constitute financial wealth? Um, can I say the balance on the check account? So the balance on your check account is the money that you have deposited in the bank. It's your money, so it's your asset. It's the same as the cash that you store under your bed. You know, if you take that cash from under your bed and you put it into the bank, then that's going to increase the balance on your check account. So both that I and cash cannot. are going to be financial wealth. Sorry? So the answer has to be three. Yes, I agree. Answer is three. And let's just confirm by looking at four. Um, you can see that there is interest received from bonds which is a, um, an income. So we can be sure that our answer is actually three. Okay, so combination, if, yeah, sorry. If I can ask a question on um, combination question one. So interest, yeah, sure. interest received from bonds and salary does not count as wealth because it's calculated over a period of time, right? Yes. Okay, no thanks. Yeah. So when I say to you, your wealth, um, you're not going to tell me your salary for the whole year. You're going to look at what money you currently have in that exact moment that I asked you about your wealth. Okay, combination question two. Money, which can be used for transactions, includes, we've got income, interest received from bonds, shares, and money. Uh, only money is money in this example. I know that sounds a bit obvious, but shares is a wealth. Um, okay, well, money can also be a wealth, so that's not a good exclusionary tactic I'm using here. Your income, your interest received from bonds, and your shares are not consisting of, are not making up money. Money is a very specific term which refers to your fiat currency, which is your coins and your reserve bank notes that you hold in your wallet, and the money that you deposit in the bank. That is what money is, according to the definition. So we can discount this one, this one. See, it's got checkable deposits here, but these are not money. Financial investment, no. Yeah, coins, notes, and checkable deposits. So our answer is five. That is what constitutes money. Um, hi, uh, 
Kennedy, can you please repeat the checkable deposit deposits again? So checkable deposits is the money that you hold in the bank in your current account. Not, not the loan that the bank gave you for your car or your house or anything like that. The money, for example, at the end of, oh, not tomorrow, the day after, that comes into your account for your salary, that amount that goes in there is adding to your checkable deposits. It's your money at the bank. Does that make sense? So it can be used for transactions? No, it can. It can. So your your money that's used at the bank um, or that's held at the bank can be used for transactions with your bank card. The same way that if you go to a shop, you can pay with your coins and notes. You can also pay with your bank card. Um, but what we're trying to uh, differentiate here when we refer to checkable deposits is I'm not referring to your credit card specifically because that's now money that you owe the bank. Okay. So okay. we're looking at, see, I'm, I'm trying to think of it in terms of loans against your house versus loans that you use for transactions. So essentially your money at the bank that you use for transactions is your checkable deposits. And if you wanted to um, increase your loans against your credit card, that could count. Um, but when we're looking at financial wealth and income, we're not looking at the loan against your house. Your, your financial wealth needs to be your asset minus your liabilities, if that makes sense. So just in, in this model, you can just think of money as the currency, which is your, your coins and your notes, and your deposits at the bank. I see there's a, um, in the chat, someone says, will the recording be shared? We currently have load shedding and my battery is about to die. Yes, I did start recording, um, and we will share the recording on the Moodle site. I just want to ask a quick question before I continue with the next um, question. We've had a few students complaining that they can't post on the discussion forum. Will you just please um, make a note for me in the chat just so that we can follow up later if you are or aren't able to post in the discussion forum on Moodle? Um, we just want to be able to follow that up with ICT because we have had a couple of students complain about that, but then others are actually able to post. So I just want to try and understand what the issue is that we're dealing with um, so we can try and get it sorted out. But please, if you could just write that in the chat rather than, um, you know, we've only got just over 15 minutes here. So I just want to try and get through the rest of these combination questions. OK, question three. Which of the following is R correct? There are different motives for holding money. So we can distinguish between the demand for active balances and the demand for passive balances. This is such a, a big question. Let's break it down into little parts. So let's first answer this one. Is this statement A true or false? Yes, it's it's true. Yes, I agree with you. I think we've gone through the active and passive balances um, quite extensively. Oh, I'm trying to draw a tick here. It's not working out. OK, A is correct. Then B, both the demand for active and passive balances are determined by the level of output and income in the economy. Do you agree? OK, the chat says false. Um, yes, so the demand for active balances is determined by the level of output and income, and the demand for passive balances is determined by the interest rate. So you need to separate them out. This is incorrect. Statement C. The level of transactions needed by people in the economy 
will influence the demand for both active and passive balances. Is that true or false? False. Yes, thank you. And the level of transactions will only influence the demand for active balances. So C is incorrect. And D, the higher the interest rate, the higher the passive demand for money. Do you agree? False. So true. true. That's true. False. 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 Okay. So the, the higher the interest rate, the higher the passive demand for money. No, it's not true because yes. it's referring to the opportunity cost of holding money. So the higher the interest rate, the lower the passive demand for money. D is incorrect. So only A is correct, which means we come down and look at our options here, and it is option four. Only A is correct. Combination question four, statement A. A purpose of this financial market model is to explain how the interest rate influences the demand for money. Do you agree or no? It is true. We're looking at the impact of the interest rates on the demand for money and then by extension on the quantity of money. So we can tick this one. Statement B. An increase in income will cause the demand for money for transaction purposes to increase. Oh. Oh. It's true. Thank you. Statement C, the liquidity preference theory of money refers to the demand for active and passive balances, which are determined by the need to do transactions and the need to keep wealth in the form of money. I didn't I think it's mention, true. yeah, I didn't mention this specifically. This is in your study guide, the liquidity preference theory, but that's what it means. So that is correct. An increase in income shifts the demand for money curve to the right. True. True. Thank you. And statement E. An increase in the interest rates is represented by an upward movement along the demand for money curve. True. That's true. That is true. So means all of our statements A, B, C, D, and E are correct. So the correct option is one. An increase in the level of output and income will cause, and let's just check the graph. So if the level of output and income increases, it's going to shift our demand for money curve. And at each interest rate, the money demand is therefore higher. So if we go back to our options, which of these options is correct? Number one. Number one. Perfect. Number one is correct. Okay, question six. Which of the following statements is are correct about the diagram? Statement A, the diagram illustrates that as the interest rate increases, the quantity of money demanded decreases. Therefore, a negative relationship exists between the interest rate and the quantity of money. That's correct. correct. Yeah, 100%. And that's why our money demand curve is downward sloping. So A is correct. Statement B. The diagram illustrates that an increase in the interest rate decreases the quantity of money demanded, and this is represented by an upward movement along the MD curve. Also true. Correct. Oh. True. And statement C. The diagram illustrates that as the level of output and income it decreases, you know, so as it decreases, the demand for active balances decreases and the interest rate increases. Yeah, false. 
because as the level of income decreases, the demand for active balances will decrease and the MD curve is going to shift to the left. So this is incorrect, which means that only A and B are correct. So I call out option two is the correct option. Combination question seven. We're almost there. As far as I remember, there's only 10 of these um, combination questions. The demand for money in an economy depends on the quantity of money, the interest rate, the multiplier, the level of output and income, the marginal propensity to consume. So first of all, we know that the multiplier and the marginal propensity to consume are not involved in this model. These are goods market um, variables. So we can exclude them already. Then we've got the level of output and income, the interest rate, and the quantity of money. Which of those do you think um, determine the demand for money? All of them. So remember that when we look at our, um, our graph, it's our money demand that causes a change in the quantity of money, not the quantity of money that causes a change in the demand for money. So only B and D are correct, which means that our correct option is four. Just think back to that chain of events where um, the change in MD leads to a change in M. It's not the change in M leading to a change in MD. Okay. Combination question eight. In this module, a lower interest rate decreases the cost of credit. And as more credit is extended to households and firms, the money demand and the quantity of money increase. Therefore, according to this interpretation, okay, statement A, there is no independent money supply curve since the quantity of money depends on the money demand and the interest rate. True. Yeah. Yes. True. This is again referring to that exogenously versus endogenously determined money supply. So, uh, or determined money. In this model, we're using endogenously determined, therefore, there's no independent money supply curve. Therefore, money is demand determined. So this is correct. We follow the demand determined money approach. What? The other way around. It's true. It's true. Yeah. So the demand determined money approach is the one where we don't have the independent money supply curve. This is just something you need to go back and read in the in the study guide. We do give quite a long explanation of it. Um, it's just something you need to remember, the difference between endogenous money and exogenous money. In this model, we follow, sorry, so this is true, um, and then statement C says we follow the exogenously determined quantity of money approach. Fourth. Yeah, thank you. We follow the endogenously determined approach. Um, statement D, an increase in the, in the money demand leads to an increase in the quantity of money. True or false? Yes, that's true. That's again looking at our chain of events where it's the, oh my gosh, the M, where the MD leads to a change in M, not the other way around. So this is true. And then I don't know why it keeps jumping like that. And then uh, statement E, an increase in the money demand leads to an increase in the level of output to income. True or false? I'll say this one is false. False, it's the other way around. Exactly, the causality is the other way around. So a change in Y, for example, an increase, is going to lead to an increase in the money demand, excuse my team here, which then leads to an increase in the quantity of money. 
switching these two around is incorrect. That's reversed causality. It's the change in output and income that leads to a change in money demand. So statement E is false. And I, I realize this is quite um, <laughs> difficult to read now. I've made marks all over it. But only statements A, B, and D are true. So that's option one is correct. Okay, combination question nine. Which of the following statements is or are correct? The repo rate is the policy rate in South Africa and all other market interest rates, such as the prime lending rate, follow changes in the repo rate. Do you agree? Yes, correct. True. True. Yeah, 100% correct. Statement B. The banks in South Africa are obliged to hold 5% of their total liabilities to the public in the form of cash reserves, with the South African Reserve Bank. True or false? False. Yeah. Fantastic. So that's again, that's one of those details that we haven't covered here that's in the study guide. As you both correctly say, it's 2.5%. So the statement is false. C. If banks experience liquidity shortages, they can borrow money at the repo rate from the SOG. True or false? Oh, yeah, it's true. True. And statement D, it is through the accommodation policy that the South African Reserve Bank provides financing to banks that require liquidity. Yeah, true. So statements A, C, and D are correct. Therefore, option five is the correct answer. Okay, this is our final question. And we've got a few minutes left, so let's quickly go through it. If the SOG wishes to follow an expansionary monetary policy, what is it going to do? Is it going to increase the repo rate or decrease the repo rate? For expansionary, they will decrease. 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 Yeah, so let's look here. So expansionary monetary policy says uh, increase so that we know that that one's wrong we can exclude it this is correct so far and this is correct so far so let's go a bit further so a decrease in the interest rates leading to an increase in the demand for money and an increase in the quantity of money that's correct looking at this one a decrease in the interest rates oh, see they reverse the causality here this is the quantity of money and this is the demand for money so that is wrong then um, obviously a monetary contraction is the opposite. So if so, a contraction is going to be an increase in the interest rate. So we can exclude this one. Then an increase in the interest rate leading to a decrease in money demand and a decrease in the quantity of money. That is correct. And once again, here you see it's the reverse causality. So that is wrong. It is only options C and D that are correct. Okay, so we've managed to get through the whole presentation, which I'm very happy about. Um, let's just quickly see, does anyone have a, a burning question? We will make this recording available afterwards. If you can just raise your hand. Um, Sibyl Kaling, go ahead. Um, sorry, um, I just wanted to ask um, maybe if you can explain uh, what is the accommodation policy. Uh, I haven't come across it in the um, book. Okay, so that one, since we've run out of time, I'm going to refer you to the study guide. Um, there's quite a long uh, section on explaining the details of how monetary policy is conducted in South Africa. And that's just something that you need to learn um, and understand. So if you can just refer back to the learning units for that one. Does anyone else have anything? We're at eight o'clock already. 
Okay, well, I'm going to say good evening to you all now. I hope um, that was informative and thank you all so much for your participation. Like I say, even a wrong answer is a good answer because at least you're thinking about it and you're you're trying. So that makes me very happy. Um, and yeah, I wish you all the best for your exam preparation. And remember that we've got a team of e-tutors on the Moodle site. So when you're going through your study material, you need to reach out to them if you have any questions. They're there to help you. And um, goodbye.